my name is Michelle Morelli. I'm with AOL, um, and we're going to be showing a screening of Makers Once and For All, which talks about the Beijing Conference. Um, but before we get started with that, what I want to do is introduce Elise Nelson mm -hmm. and Laura Liswood. Um, these folks were actually at the conference, so before we actually dive into the film, what I want to do is actually ask them about their experience. If you both can set the context, that would be really lovely before we dive into the film, um, because it really is a watershed moment in women's rights. Um, it was probably one of the most important events uh, of my lifetime, for sure, and of many women's lifetime here. So if you could possibly give us your personal context and the context of the time, that would be amazing. Sure. Well, I'm not going to share too much about my personal context, sure. only because it's in the film. But first, yeah. I want to say a massively huge thank you to mm -hmm. AOL and Makers for putting this film together, because I think that you know, very few people know about this conference. They know maybe about Hillary Clinton's famous speech, you know, women's rights or human rights, but they don't know what really happened for women and why it was significant and why, quite frankly, it was the beginning of the global women's movement. Um, I was a very young woman, 21 years old, a college student when I attended on a total whim, but you'll hear about that a little bit in the film. Um, although they don't talk about how I didn't actually get my visa and I had to sneak in and all that stuff. <laughs> AOL was very, <laughs> anyway. Yeah. That's that okay. That's probably, that's probably for the best. If I ever need a security <laughs> clearance in the future, or getting back into China, et cetera. But, um, but anyway, I think one of the things that I would just like to say to kind of lay this out is that, um, uh, I don't know, did you introduce me? I can't remember. Sorry. Uh, if you like, no, all <laughs> I did was say your name. If you can talk about so, what you do. So um, I'm Elise Nelson. I work um, for an organization called Vital Voices Global Partnership. I'm the president and CEO. I've been doing it for the last 20 years since I went to Beijing. Um, so it was uh, it had a really transformative impact on my life. This is one of my great mentors, mm -hmm. uh, Laura Liswood. Laura Liswood is the um, chair, or no, I'm sorry, general secretary general of the Council of Women World Leaders, which is actually the most powerful network of women in the world. It's all of the current and present um, prime ministers and presidents who are female in the world. Um, and she, I want her to tell you more about mm -hmm. that because at the time of Beijing, she was just starting that and beginning on that journey. I think one of the big things that I would say is in the 20 years since Beijing, we've had incredible progress. So although we are certainly not there yet at all in terms of women's progress, what I've certainly seen is that leaps and bounds. We wouldn't be here at Davos 20 years ago, which she can tell you about because she was here at Davos nearly 20 <laughs> years ago. Um, you know, we wouldn't be having these discussions. I'm sorry, I don't know if AOL would have funded this, you know, 20 years ago. Probably not. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, um, but I think it's, it's, it really does showcase that it is a new day. I mean, today we have data and research mm -hmm that proves that investing in women is actually smart. No country, no community, no corporation can say I'm gonna ignore women and women's rights and opportunities and what they bring because they simply won't be able to compete in a global marketplace without women and girls. So can I ask a question on that? Mm -hmm. So is that true across the board because, or is that more of a US focused, um, uh, the equality, I think, is probably more uneven. So I guess the question is, how do we make sure globally that we are moving in the right direction? And do you think globally that we have oh, made... globally, I yes, think we're yeah, moving in... Okay. When I speak about that, I'm, I'm really speaking from a global perspective. Great. We Perfect. have the global research to show this. Amazing. Um, so definitely this is not just something in the U.S. In fact, I'd say the U.S. is, is, is falling further and further behind. Agreed. And other countries are actually leapfrogging forward because they get it. Yep. And they say, oh, okay, you know, want to wanna fast forward my economy? Invest in women mm -hmm. and girls. And they see it as a, as a strategic thing to do. Now, I'm, this is, you know, slow baby steps, but we have seen progress. Um, I want Laura to talk about um, her experience going to Beijing um, and also just a little bit about her work. Um, and then I'll, and then we'll, Kind bring of it back a little bit more discussion. Great, thanks. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Elise. And you know, Elise may say I'm her mentor. I'm her greatest admirer. She's, you know, she, she says she's been in this field for 20 years. I'm going. Okay, how old were you when you started <laughs> this? <laughs> 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 I was yeah, yeah, I think that's about right. But I've watched Elise in terms of her growth and her leadership and the impact that she has had. It's just been phenomenal. So back to you on that one. All right, so. Um, first off, I didn't have a visa problem. 
I was not <laughs> I was not part of the American delegation, the official delegation. I was part of the Polish delegation. And I had this badge on that said Polish de delegation, and all these women were coming up to me and speaking Polish to me, you yeah. know, which was not particularly useful. Um, but I had, in the process of my journey, I had interviewed the prime minister of uh, Poland, Hanna Sohatka, and, uh, you know, I knew I, I wanted to be an official delegate, um, and so that's how I, that's how I got to Beijing. And part of how, why I wanted to go to Beijing was that I had two questions or two thoughts in, initially, um, which was what would it be like if we had a woman president in the United States? That was sort of an initial question. Right. And then what could I bring to Beijing? Because, you know, none of us kind of knew what this was going to be and the impact that it was going to have and, you know, the incredible both logistics challenges of it, which there were a lot of those, but just the, the amount of energy from women all over the world was just stunning. Mm -hmm. It was just stunning. And so I wanted to, well, I, I had this idea to interview all of the living women presidents and prime ministers in the world. Having no idea why I thought I could interview <laughs> a woman president or prime minister. As I often say, I'm not Barbara Walters. I am not from CNN. Um, I've never asked anyone what kind of a tree they would be if they were a tree. So my, my interview skills, you know, little, not so good. Um, but what was interesting was, that, you know, I, I, I presented my concept uh, to asking for the interview, saying that I wanted to bring something to Beijing. And that seemed to resonate uh, with these uh, 14, uh, 15 women heads of state. Um, and so not, as you know, Michelle, not one of the world leaders did turn me down for the interview um, the f out of the 15. As I told Michelle, and Michelle knows, um, Margaret Thatcher did say, come back after you've met everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Margaret Thatcher, <laughs> right. So I was, uh, but you know, the truth of the matter was, um, so I did interview the other 14, and she did grant me the interview. Um, and I, I'm an experiential learner, so I was actually quite appreciative of the fact that I'd met f 14 other presidents and prime ministers before I got to Margaret Thatcher, because mm -hmm. I kind of needed all the skill sets <laughs> um, uh, that, 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 you know, she was, you know, she, she drove the camera people mad, completely <laughs> mad. Um, she, um, um, she, 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 she uh, I had to bring a makeup person. Uh, and someone said, for you or for her, uh, it was for her. <laughs> yeah, very aware of her, her image. Um, uh, expressed, uh, I learned a lot in the process of meeting all these women leaders. That was one, one of the things that was for my journey. Um, and, you know, she un ultimately did, with her, when I agreed with her policies, um, did show a real leadership trait, which was curiosity. Yeah. Uh, um, so my interview with her was scheduled for half an hour. I was actually with her for two and a half hours uh, because she was enormously curious what the other leaders had said. Uh, had said. Um, well, caveat, it took about an hour to get through the Falklands War. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> you know a lot of comments about the Falklands. But anyway, because one of the things that I think still exists today for women is that um, if you, these, I'm the only person who's actually met all these women leaders. And if you don't have someone who's in your similar situation and things start happening to you and you don't have anybody to go, is that happening to you? Mm -hmm. you, know, um, you women particularly, we have a tendency to go, well, there must be something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, We think it's pathological to us. So that's why I love these kinds of things right. because we can have these kinds of discussions. And so that incidentally was, I, as I started meeting them, and if anyone wants to know the trick to meet 15 prime ministers, I'll tell you at some point. Um, you get to about the seventh, and the pr prime ministers still don't know who you are, right? But you in met seven other prime ministers, so you must be somebody. You know, that's how they think about it. And then you, I discovered that if the gatekeeper to the prime minister or president was a woman, I had no trouble. They knew about Beijing. They were very encouraging to me. They tried the best they could to get me the interview. If the gatekeeper was a man, they could care less about Beijing. So you had to say things like, you don't want your prime minister to be the only one not in this, do you? <laughs> <laughs> so the competitive sort of thing right. seemed to work for the, for the males. Um, anyway, um, you know, so uh, what happened was I ended up, I was doing a video documentary for it, and uh, so I developed a rough cut. I wasn't finished completely, so I developed a rough cut uh, of it. And uh, as part of the delegation, I was able to show this film. 
And it really is powerful because I think sometimes we don't realize that women are in these positions of power. They were already in these positions of power. We just didn't know who they were. And they came, they were global. I mean, they came across the world. Some of them legacy leaders, some of them husbands or fathers, assassination, that kind of thing. But others had been freely elected. Um, so I did ask them if they wanted to meet each other. They said they did. So we actually ended up post-Beijing having a forum in um, Stockholm where they all, not, not Margaret Thatcher didn't come. Um, <laughs> she was not the feminist in the crowd. Um, but uh, the rest, most all of them came. That's how we created this council. Uh, and the purpose of the council is to raise the visibility of women as leaders you know, and to create a more collective voice, which I think is what Beijing was really about, creating this collective voice, having people hear other people's sets of experiences across the globe. You know, so someone you would never have any personal contact with, someone from a very different continent than you, you know, from a di very different socioeconomic group than you, whichever that right. was, you began to see all these similarities and all the kinds of things that, peop that women were going through. I think it was very empowering for women to be able to, to, be able to do that. So that's how the council got formed. Um, there are now uh, 55 members of the council. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Joanne's been in <laughs> seen this growth. <laughs> That, well, it, don't forget, it's cumulative. Oh. So once you're in, unless you get jailed, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is not n unnecessarily <laughs> unlikely, oh, uh, the, the death ones are in the in memoriam category. But the li 55 living, yeah. So if any of you are freely elected head of state or head of government, which I hope one of you will be or more than one of you will be, you will be invited to join the council. Uh, we'll wait about three months to make sure you stick. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But after that, so how, how many are in office today? You, um, you know that very it goes and comes and goes. Usually, you don't get beyond a bandwidth of ten to fifteen. Wow. You know, eight to fifteen mm -hmm. is usually what you because they come in, they go out, they, you know, all of that. What, 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 how about Kim from Canada? Kim Campbell, was, yes, she, she was. Well, <laughs> no, actually, she didn't, and I, she became the, cha the chair of our council, and I'm forever mortified by the fact that I didn't interview her, you know. But she did become the chair of the council. She became a member and all of that. Yeah, because originally it was a nine-month nine month pause. So I thought, nine months, that's pretty symbolic, you know. <laughs> so, you know, so that's, that's how all of this sort of got Can I started. ask about the qualities? You mentioned yeah. Thatcher's quality. W for leaders, yeah. what are you seeing um, the trend through with women in particular? You know, it's interesting. It's both um, the good news and the bad news, you know. There are, there are more women, you know. They come, from, they come from all different, you know, religions and groups, et cetera. Um, to this day, they are still complaining about over scrutiny of their person, of their dress, of their hairstyle, mm -hmm. of their speaking style. Mm -hmm. So that one hasn't gone away so much. Now, what has helped, I think, is that for a woman leader to actually make change in right. a country, right, that's one of the problems with legacy leaders. They're thrust into the power position. They're often in very conservative cu cultures, right? They have no women in their cabinet. They have very few women in their parliament. So even if they wanted to create change, they can't. Right. Benazir Bhutto was a, a perfect example, and I got to know Benazir quite well. Um, she did have these desires to change, but she's in a country that, you know, it was almost impossible right. for her to make these changes. Um, but I think today you have, if you look at how many women are in parliaments now, you know, how many women are in ministries now, I mean, Justin Trudeau, puts 50 percent of you know women right. in them. so as a woman leader you, I think you have more abilities to create that change and what's also ironic is and he, this was you know uh, I was sort of doing this before you know a lot of people doing it now most of the women leaders get invited to do conferences and things like right. that so they're, they're they're getting a lot of visibility mm. for themselves and you know and I, I suspect at least one or two of them will be potential candidates for the secretary general's job you know um, so you know, I think a lot more visibility is going on with these people, and a lot more potential for change mm -hmm. is going on. But again, there's you know the the good news, bad news. They're they're still suffering from some of the exact same scrutinies mm -hmm. that the other women leaders had. You know, I came away with an I like this one. If you can see it, you can be it. You yeah, know. if you can see. Yeah. It, you can see it. Um, when I interviewed the president of Iceland, she had been president for 16 years. She told me after she was in office about eight years going around Iceland, talking to the children. 
she discovers that for the children under eight, they all think only a woman can be president That's amazing. of Iceland. Yeah. And that the boys have to ask, can so I be great. president of Iceland? So we cannot underestimate the role that anyone in this room, if you're sitting here, trust me, you're a role model in whatever it is you're doing, because you wouldn't be sitting here otherwise. And similarly, you know, paralleling this, this is my 16th year at the forum. You know. um, so I've seen the arc of change at the forum. Right. You know, I often say that when I first started here, you could shoot a cannon through the Congress Hall and not hit a woman, <laughs> because there were so few. Right. The first thing we did was up at the Steigenberger, one of the small rooms, wasn't even part of the, it was Klaus Schwab endorsed it, mm -hmm. but that was it. Completely full. Everyone was saying, why isn't this in the Congress Hall? You know, it took us three years to get w one, one event in the Congress Hall. Now, I mean, I'm, I'm just stunned, both within the Congress Hall and these kinds of things, they're extraordinary, you know. And I think that that's, you know, that, that I, I don't know if Beijing was the, I don't know if it was the catalyst to it, but it certainly one has to ask yourself without Beijing. Yeah, what would it be? Yeah. So can I ask, what is the most pressing concern that you think women should be addressing today? With Beijing yeah. 20 years ago, what do you think should be, for both of you, what do you think we should be focusing on? Oh, no. <laughs> um, so I would say without question, and I actually do say this in the film, that it's violence against women. Mm -hmm. Because to me, it's the one issue that sadly mm -hmm. connects and affects every Everyone. single one of us. It's not about socioeconomic background. It's not about country, culture, religion, age, nothing. You know, no woman on earth is free from it, protected from it. No country is free from it. So we also know, you know, it's getting worse. Mm -hmm. It's used as a tactic of war. That's something that's emerged more post the Beijing Women's Conference. We also know it's lucrative. Human trafficking, trafficking, for example, trafficking of girls. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, you know, if we don't tackle that, and sadly we have a lot less research than we do in some other areas, like we have, a, we have more research that looks at, well, you know, invest in women entrepreneurs and women's economic abilities and girls' education, because that builds stronger economies. But actually, guess what? There have been some studies in some countries that show the billions of dollars lost from the economy from not addressing just domestic violence. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's $8 billion in the United States lost every year from loss of productivity, health care costs. Um, in, in Europe, for example, they um, realized that they were spending millions upon millions of dollars with trials of women who'd been killed by their intimate partners, by their husbands or boyfriends. And if they could just put some of those millions into stopping this, enforcing a law in the books that says that domestic violence is illegal, you know, maybe they'd save some money in these trials, right? I mean, it's just, yeah. Yeah. so I, I do believe that the economic argument has certainly helped us move things forward. Sure. But I think some of these other issues we need to figure out, well, how do we, how do we spread the word? How do we right. do a little bit more research so we can show that, that there's great impact? But to me, you know, that's the thing that, that keeps me up at night. Right. The other things are tracking and moving forward. That's mm -hmm. the thing that's sliding backwards. Right. And it's just, it's very scary. It reminds me of the saying, women, uh, men are scared that women, w women will laugh at them. Women are scared men will kill them. Uh, have you ever heard that? I've never heard Okay, that. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Usually. I, I think I have an answer. Now. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you know, I knew Elise was going to be very good and fluent, fluent this, so she'll let me think about it. So I'm not sure I can pinpoint the one, although without question, no disagreement on that issue. Um, just let me give you again a little bit of perspective, I think. The, when the gender gap report started, do all of you are familiar with World Economics Forum's gender gap report? If you're not, I really do recommend it. Um, it looks at four major categories, health, education, economic opportunity, and political participation. And it looks at 145 countries. Unfortunately, Africa is not well represented because of the data aren't there. Mm -hmm. That's the challenge. And so one of the things we must have are the data to do the actionable kinds of things. But what has happened over this 10-year arc is that not everywhere by any means, but health gaps have closed. Not completely, not every country. Education gaps have closed. You know, not everywhere, not completely. But certainly demonstrative change in the closing of the gender gap. And the gap is the resources dedicated to men, the resources dedicated to women. If they're equal, then you get a one. 
right? Whether it's 50 cents that you have or $5,000. It doesn't matter right. what, so it's the gap issue. What is not closing is, are the economic opportunity and the political participation gaps. Those are not closing. So this belief that we had that if you get them healthy, you educate them, then naturally they'll get into the workforce, they'll participate in the political system. Well, it's turning out there's nothing natural about it. And so one of the things that sort of keeps me up at night is what are the leverages? Because we're plateauing in a lot of areas now. Mm -hmm. You know, political participation, you know, basically. So what are the maximum levers that, that, are, that, that we can identify? Now, we have a lot of data. We do. And that's also been different. We have far more disaggregated data than we ever had before. You know, the challenge is, and I do say this fairly frequently, I normally do not quote Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, the former Secretary <laughs> of Defense. Oh, okay. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Normally, I do not quote this man. But he did have this concept of the known knowns, the known unknowns. You know. So we have this thing called the, the no, no, let's see, the, the unknown knowns, the unknown knowns. They're known, but we act as if they are not known. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, to me, you know, so we have these the data around domestic violence. But you know, because the women aren't in the workforce as much, you know, because economic empowerment will help reduce some of that, although sometimes there's backlash to that. It, yeah, there's backlash in some points. But the political participation, we had more women in the parliaments, we had more m women at the local level, potentially more laws could be in, in place. So, you know, all of these things are so intertwined mm -hmm. with each other. But I just think we, we all have to think about why potentially we are plateauing, or in some cases yeah. going backwards. Yeah. I really do think we need to, we need, we were at a breakfast this morning and kind of talking about how we've been talking about these things for like 10 years, the same stuff. Mm -hmm. And okay, it's good because I guess maybe not everybody sitting here knew it, but it's like we need, we need new ideas here because clearly we're just like, we need some breakthrough ideas. I definitely think involving men, as Shelly's talked about, is really yeah. important. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 because I mean, we really do. I believe very strongly right now, women have the megaphone. It's like these issues, I can tell you, are so much more mainstream than when we began working on these issues. So much more mainstream. People are paying attention. I mean, people were outraged, obviously, with the fact that girls had been kidnapped in Nigeria. You know, and you think about it you know, terrible things happened to girls all over the world, and people weren't never outraged on that scale before. So in that sense, it was a breakthrough, even though, as we know, the girls didn't come back. And so it's, it was not a success. Um, and we hope it will be, obviously, some way to, you know, move forward in the future. But I think that that's, you know, as I was saying earlier, that's the big problem. It's like people will listen, they'll talk about it, but they won't then take the next step of, like, putting money into it putting resources behind it, making, you know, behavioral change. And so it's like, well, how do we get there? How do we move beyond just the awareness and having the megaphone? Because mm -hmm. I'm really happy to be here, but it's like it doesn't make any difference if we can't translate the rhetoric into, like, real results. Mm -hmm. Joanna, you were going to say something. I was going to ask you the same question. What are your ideas? I, yeah. I, I do believe yeah. what do what? that we're – we're at a point, if you know the sort of thought of S-curve that yeah. technology yeah. uses, we're at a point that what you guys have done and others are, is just so fucking amazing <laughs> that we've run <laughs> a you gotta get that on the bell. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And what you've done, too. Back to you. I, back I to you. <laughs> I, have, I have been in this for a minute and a half. You have really made a difference. You have put your hearts in it, but also your heads, and also your muscle. Now we're at a new S-curve. And something in, and I know, Shelley, you've said this as well, that this notion of community, I know that the anecdotal evidence is when women come together and say, we are not going to allow this anymore, whether it was in Auschwitz or whether it is in Rwanda or wherever it is, when the women are able to come together and say that in Liberia and take the risk of dying as a result of what they're doing, we create change. Is there something else? That it's in your mind saying, I wish, if you could have that wish fulfilled, what would it be? You know, it's interesting, John. Because um, <laughs> if one looks at what is it actually, what has uh, moved the dial on a, in a lot of places, um, 
uh, and you know, you'll all have differing opinions on this, but the, the evidentiary data are what has actually moved the dial are affirmative mechanisms. Yeah. You know, all sorts of, you know, issues around it and everything like that, but no parliament in the world other than Finland has gotten <laughs> to critical mass in its parliament without some affirmative mechanism. Yeah. And we see this with the boards of directors and all of that kind of stuff, you know. And so I don't know exactly what I'm saying here in terms of how, how we translate that, but if you want an S-curve kick, you're going to need something that actually forces changed behavior mm. in a way. In effect, you say it has to be intentional. Absolutely. It has of to be course. intended of course. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. just happen because no. some oh, no. people <laughs> <It's> exactly correct. <laughs> and completely really silly. Until and unless we get the historically dominant group in the room, in, engaged, involved, historically over, you know, uh, in power groups, yeah, with the historically out of power groups, it's going to be hard to think about how do we actually change the power structures, how do we actually yeah. change behaviors. So I'm completely in agreement with you. And I don't, and that, if I look at what we have not done particularly well, is that. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. And you know, it's, somebody said earlier today, oh, if we've made any mistake with the women's movement, it was to not engage men. And I would actually disagree. Because I think, you know, in the beginning of any movement, you need to have, you know, <laughs> it's fine to oh, just yeah. be women, okay? <laughs> So, but I think now we're at a place where, okay, we know where we're going, we've got the road map, we know what we want, we also have enough power in society to help guide it, but now we do need men. And one of the things that we talk about a lot at By the Voices, it's actually something that I learned from this incredible Pakistani filmmaker that we work with, is this idea that if we could just engage the silent majority. And the silent majority are people like us around the world who care deeply about these issues. I do want to make an offer, but Shelly, I'm going to I'm going to need your help on this offer because I don't have the wait, 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 I don't have the capacity to do this. Um, the the film was produced. Uh, it was shown on PBS. It's been shown around the world, etc. Um, and I'm actually going to be doing an update of the for the new women heads of state. But if you would like a copy of the film, please tell Shelly. <laughs> okay, we're good. Yeah. And, and then I'm, too. there I is a book. book. Yeah, Amazon, you can buy the book, right? but the, the video I'm, I'm, and then I will send you all how many ever requests you got. You'll send them out. We'll talk about that. Um, that was a 4,500 corporate limit, so. Okay, well, we may have to talk about reproducing 4,500 <laughs> copies, but, you know, that's not, that, you know, that's not the, 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 the barrier we, ha we have to worry about. I would ask you, watch the film, you know, and then don't put it on the social media. Uh, because I promised the heads of state that it couldn't, wouldn't go on. Um, but please donate it to a school or library. Because mm. yeah. schools, they're just not enough women visible yeah. role models. So if you, you know, if you ask her, that's the commitment I will ask back that's perfect. to you. Yeah. Um, and then I'm going to leave with something I always like to say, because I completely agree with you, we're not collaborating on this stuff, is, uh, is a, something I came up with, which is um, women are like snowflakes. One alone may melt, but together we can stop traffic. Nice. <laughs>